And we now have a fantastic final panel, and I'm going to be joined, and am joined by Joelle here, um, to introduce our final panel. So I'll hand over to you, Joelle. Introduce thank our you. first panelist. <coughs> yes, thank you. So in our final panel, we have to start with Professor Laura Vandenberg from uh, University of Massachusetts uh, Amherst from the US. Come up. You are wired. I'm good. Great, and my turn now. Um, I'd like to invite Isaac, Isaac Olufadewa, who is a doctor um, and also executive director of the Slum and Rural Health Initiative. Welcome, Isaac, please. <clears throat> Next, uh, Mr. Luis Vallas, Ambassador and Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs, Ecuador. I'll come up. And John Tumpain, who is Head of Department at the Department of Environment at FORMAS, which is the Swedish Research Council for Sustainable Development and also one of the supporters of the summit. John, welcome. And last but not least, Dr. Katka Sepkova, Director of the National Center of Toxic Compounds and of the Stockholm Center Convention Regional Center from the Czech Republic. Here she comes. <laughs> hmm. So, we have heard from the last speaker, call for action words into action. So my first question goes to all of you, not at the same time, one <laughs> after the other. <laughs> so from your point of view and maybe also your background where you come from and your role in this field, what is the most important message, the most important issue or point that was brought up during these two days that would really move us forward, that would really move us from insights to action, from reactivity to proactivity. We start with Laura. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you for inviting me to be up here. Um, so I'm a research scientist, uh, a professor. I teach um, undergrads when they let me in the classroom. And <laughs> um, one of the things that really struck me over the last few days was an impression that I didn't have before I arrived here, which is that the, the state of, of where we are in terms of consensus about the problem has changed. And uh, I feel, it, it, my field is environmental health sciences. I'm an endocrinologist by training, so I study endocrine disrupting chemicals. And for the last 15 years, we, every time I show up, I have to argue with people that this problem's real. <laughs> And I haven't felt like that today. I felt like we started from a different place. And what's great about that is that the field of environmental health is really focused on identifying problems. And we have to get past identifying the problem in order to get to a solution. So I'm leaving here really feeling like we're ready to think about solutions. And we've heard a lot about possible solutions. We're going to have to pick from the grab bag about uh, what to do, but that leaves me with a lot of hope, and I, I feel like um, we got there with climate change, surprisingly, as much as Americans don't believe in climate change, young people in America do. And so I feel like we're getting there also with chemicals, pollution, plastics, all the stuff that keeps me up at night. Thank you. Thank Isaac. You so for me, um, I'm a researcher, I'm a clinician, and I'm also the, I also lead Slum and Rural Health Initiative, which is an organization that looks at you know, combina combining advocacy, evidence-based research, and innovation to be able to solve many of the challenges uh, that faces, especially like Nigeria and many African countries. Um, so I think the word for me is outreach. And when I say outreach, I mean just like following up on what you know, uh, one of our uh, panelists has talked about, is we need to see how to get into the solution. Um, we need 
the researchers who are doing the work and you know having this evidence to take this work to policymakers. We need you know researchers to be able to incorporate these into the curriculum you know of clinicians or you know future medical um, future clinicians either in medical school or for clinicians in like their continuing medical education program. We need outreach to the public to be more aware about these issues, and when they are more aware about these issues, they can can ensure that the research policy and program implementation is really carried out as um, efficiently as possible because that is what we need, you know, because I've worked all my life advancing health equity and I discovered that like how, why we know about the problem and why we are excited about like the possible solutions. Once like the public do not know about this, um, they cannot really be action. Rwanda, um, Rwanda banned single-use plastics in 2008, but do you know how many years they used in terms of public engagement, public awareness? They used three years. So for, since 2005 to 2008, before the fantastic implementation of that policy, you know, they were doing a lot of this outrage. So if it's one word I want to stick you know, to all your minds, if I could do that, I would say it's the word outrage. Thank you. Thank you. Luis. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, well, I will use three words, not just one <laughs> word. I will say it, science policy interface. And uh, to say that, I have reaffirmed what I already believe, but here during these two days, and answering your question, how we pass from being reactive to proactive, I think that's the solution, at least from my point of view as a negotiator, as a representative of a country that is in MEAs, in negotiations of environmental, multilateral uh, environmental uh, negotiations. And this relation between scientific community and policymakers, I believe that it has to be formal. It has to be institutionalized to make it effective. And what we have been doing these two days, yesterday and today. You know, I feel very lucky, actually. Very, very lucky to have been here, to listen for you, from you, to have been participating in such a well-organized summit. Robert, Jane, you have done a, such a good job, all the moderators, all the panelists, all the participants. So I wish what I have experienced these two days, my colleagues from other countries, my colleagues from Ecuador, will have the same opportunity. So that's what we do, and that's what we should keep doing. This relation between a scientific community and a police a, and decision a, makers, but I think we need to do it also in a formal way. And it's a double way. It's also from scientists to policy makers, but also we need to tell you what we need. Mm -hmm. So we need to identify together what we need, identify together the problem, tackle together that problem, and of course, work together with the solution. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much for a wonderful conference as well. Um, I actually I talked back to something some Yitte Uteland, uh, Guteland said this morning. She said that, to paraphrase it, that we know enough to act now and that there's a window of opportunity. And I think everyone in this room really knows the evidence base. We know that we have enough scientists or science that there's an impetus to act now, an imperative to act now. We also know that we meet, need more research and innovation. That I need to say that as a research funder. Mm -hmm. And that we need to invest more in this and to, like Louise said, to invest powerfully in the science policy interface and to make sure that we have robust mechanisms for science policy. But I also thought that to act now requires leadership. And looking out at the room, you can see that the research community really are showing leadership on this issue. There are some diplomats and politicians who are showing leadership on the uh, issue as well. We maybe need to see more political leadership. But as I talked to a few people today as well, I would like to see more leadership from the business community. The business community has shown some leadership on climate change. They've started to realize about biodiversity. I believe that there are some sectors and businesses that could actually 
show genuine leadership uh, on this issue. And then I think we need to have a conversation about how to build coalitions of the willing, where it's not just researchers who are driving the issue, but that we have researchers and policymakers and businesses together driving the issue. And that when we talk about science policy, we can also talk about maybe the science decision maker um, uh, interface, where businesses also need to make decisions about w what risks they're taking and what future they imagine for themselves and for the world. So I think leadership would be my word for today. Finally. <coughs> okay, good afternoon everyone. So I'm a chemist by training, but for last almost 20 years I'm working in the science policy interface. I have, have been a ministry official, I've been a negotiator in my own country, in Europe, but also globally. Uh, and for the last 11 years I work in the Stockholm Convention Regional Center for Capacity Building and Transfer of Technology, where we try to spread um, and teach and, and, and really bring the latest knowledge to countries who don't have enough capacities themselves, who probably do not have the good quality universities, or who do not have, due to the frequent changes in um, representation at the policy level, technical levels, uh, good enough knowledge to be able to manage certain pollution and chemicals management issues themselves. And um, I'm trying to, you know, tie loose ends and look for opportunities. And when I came here uh, to this meeting, my primary goal was to really make the workshop A happen and bring some more information to you about the negotiations and opportunities for a scientific community engaging and really getting ready for becoming members in the science policy panel that is to be established. Uh, hopefully 2025 and you know having discussion having heard discussion in the workshop G this afternoon and participating in discussions and also seeing some really great job that scientific community is doing in trying really to bring in existing knowledge in scientific field uh, where during the negotiations of the plastic treaty I think um, it would be really worthwhile that more scientists would mobilize themselves. And even though it doesn't mean new research papers, it doesn't mean more research funding for their work, it actually can be an incremental change into making things happen. And not only trying to expand our knowledge, but really teach people, practitioners on the ground, what it means to do the risk management, why they actually could, should focus on certain limit values. So to me, I was, what I was trying to convey this, these two days is we have instruments, but they are scattered. And it is important to understand the, the structure or the, if you want, not governance, it's not a good world. It's, it's really how, where we have the different hooks where you can tie your strings and pull or push, and where you can tie knots and actually collaborate, create effective partnerships. We have World Health Organization, UNEP, ILO. We have scientific movements that are trying really to convey, okay, you shouldn't use plastic containers that were filled with chemicals for something else because it's really harmful to you. And some people have learned the tough lesson and paid for their life with it. And that doesn't happen that much anymore, but it still happens. And the role of scientists is to bring new knowledge and put it forward and the role of decision makers is to listen and pick it up and make it happen because the decision makers are responsible for well-being of their communities, of, of their people in their own countries. But there are things like chemicals who do not respect borders and we have spoken about that in the first day. So there are things which countries cannot do alone and the partnership and collaboration is extremely needed in this field. And we, we have now 
the instruments. They may not be probably as strong globally as we had wanted. They are not all of them legally binding, but they are there. And I do agree with Laura, there is change in the world. Now, for the last two years, we've spoken about triple planetary crisis. People start recognizing that the issue of climate change, biodiversity, and pollution caused by chemicals is as important as the other two. It takes change, the velocity or the speed in which the information hits the target is slower in the chemical world, but it's getting there, we are getting there. So the opportunities will multiply. So I do advocate for you, please be open-minded and look for the opportunity. It's there, it will come and we will be more reactive, uh, proactive. Thank you. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much for those uh, opening words. I'm going to have to do a quick follow-up straight away, actually, Katharina, which is, to, I mean, you say the velocity. It's not quick enough. Yeah. How do we make it quicker? How do we close the loop between the research and, and the policy to actually make that faster? by understanding how it works, by getting involved in your national delegations, by what Jutta said, she, she would be happy to host a workshop in the parliament. Maybe just try, speak to your local representative, speak to your local community. I'm, I'm sure that city of Uppsala have good collaboration with the university. Try to organize something like these meetings. In my country, we are privileged that I'm, as I am director of National Center for Toxic Compounds, I have this two-way communication between my ministries responsible for chemicals management in various fields. So I actually am organizing two times a year meetings in relation to different conventions and we are bringing in new knowledge like the scientific advances. Then the ministries can pick you up to be part of the delegation and participate in those international meetings and actually make the change. We need more scientists in those meetings than lawyers and economists, honestly. We need someone. <laughs> when we speak about chemicals and regulation of chemicals, we need people who understand the technology, who have the knowledge behind, and not only those who put it into legal words. Thank you. Um, we, Okay, so we, we heard a lot about scientists should reach out. It was a lot about scientists. Who else should act and act now? I, I heard... Yeah, I, Laura, you, you're nodding. <laughs> well, I, I think, you know, the medical community is, mm. a, is an untapped opportunity. Mm -hmm. Most people see a physician, um, hopefully once a year. And, and we, in the Endocrine Society, we've been working very hard to get education to medical professionals, not just endocrinologists, but to medical professionals about the effect of environmental pollution. What we hear from clinicians is they don't like being asked questions they don't know the answers to. And so when their patients are asking them questions about, is this thing in my house really all that bad? Or should I be avoiding PFAS? Or should I be getting tested for PFAS? Mm -hmm. If they don't readily have an answer, they're not going to come up with one. Mm -hmm. So so we have to start to work with the medical community and use them as the wedge that they can be for good. The medical community was essential in interventions focused on domestic violence, guns in the home, uh, tobacco smoke, um, lead in, in the home. So I think that that's, that's low-hanging fruit as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. Isaac, is yes, so I said, like, yeah, yeah, as a clinician, <laughs> I no, no, no. <laughs> yes, so as a clinician, I think that's like really an excellent point. Um, I think we need to also like work with the people who are in charge of the curriculum, mm -hmm. you know, from medical schools. Uh, it's really vital that we can like really introduce, you know, while I was learning about like pollution, environmental pollution, you know, there was really not anything said about, you know, ERCs and everything. So. We need more of this, you know, in the medical school curriculum. We also need to add this to the, you know, continuing medical education curriculum, so that like, you know, current doctors can really know about this. They can really, you know, be able to advise on this. And I think, you know, also ensuring that like, 
local education and social workers also know about these issues because we have nutritionists also like you know mm -hmm. counseling people because there's a really big growing wave of like non-communicable diseases in Africa and like many low and middle income countries and if people that you know counsel people on obesity you know, know about obesity genes for instance they can Take, you know, they can help the people to be able to know how to where to learn more about these issues, how to take the right action, and how to like really just make the um, right decisions. Thank you. <laughs> so, so John, then uh, the, the next form of schools will be not on research project, but. <laughs> communication and education project, or how do you...? Yeah, actually, we, we um, sent a report to the government uh, about two weeks ago about a chemically secure future, and we actually point out this issue about collaboration as well as identifying those areas which, uh, which need more research and innovation. We also point out that collaboration is going to be central to this, to deepen the collaboration between regulatory agencies and the research community, but also to get business uh, on board, as I said earlier. And I think it's also important important for us to think about working at all different levels. We need engagement and mobilization at the local level, we need to do it at the national level, at the regional level and at the global level and to get that kind of policy coherence. So we need to engage in this kind of collaboration at all those levels as well. I actually have a, a proposal that I'd like to test out on you, John and, and Luis, and everybody else feel free to chip in. Uh, there have been a couple of examples of, of actually making the science policy interface happen, I agree, institutionalization is really important, but also to do it in a, in a way that really supports an ongoing process or an emerging thing, such as the Global Plastics Treaty. I'm wondering whether, John, do you think that you, or perhaps together with other research agencies in Sweden, you might be willing to work together with a, a, a country like Ecuador and maybe some others to try and pull together scientists and negotiators in a sort of sp safe space where negotiation isn't happening, but an exchange can really truly happen to, in order to have that interface where science is well, can, can not only present but be somewhat interrogated, can learn and understand the policy process. Would you prepare to, to work together on, on something like that? Because we've got, <laughs> what, 12 months or so to, <laughs> to make it all happen? What do you say? John first, and there is. <laughs> definitely, I think we should talk about that, and I think uh, you're both right about the need to institutionalize that kind of science policy process, but it's also very important with, with uh, transparency and legitimacy, and that it needs to be, yeah, yeah, it's nice if you say that it's foremost, but it needs to be that kind of body that has the respect and legitimacy of the scientific community that can facilitate that kind of dialogue. So I think that research funders and academies and those kind of agencies have an important role to play. We have a very good relationship with the Schemikalien uh, Spehon and the regulatory agency here, so I think it's good to use different parts of the state apparatus in that, and I would gladly talk more to Luis about that. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, of course, and I'm very happy to, to talk about it too, because how it happens, you know, when we need to uh, bring to negotiations a uh, country position, we, we work inside of our countries, we work with different institutions, we work with uh, different stakeholders, sometimes it's even more difficult to agree inside of our countries <laughs> than <laughs> negotiating with other countries. But when, when we have and when we need the contribution of the, the scientific community, I think it's quite a good idea. Because we need the best available science and independent science to, to bring in those country positions too. And of course, you know, we might have it in Ecuador. I think we could also talk with academia, with scientists in Ecuador. There is big research is going on, but, but why should we close this relation with inside of the country when we could have also uh, uh, information, data from, from other places. And uh, we have, you know, to remember also from the perspective of the negotiators that behind the data, behind the information, behind each figure, there is a human face too. And sometimes we forget about that. Thank you. Yeah, I, I had a comment to <clears throat> that at the EU level, this science policy interface strengthening is already happening. The EU has, within the Horizon Europe, put forward a number of partnerships where directly that should speed up the, really the transfer. And perhaps many of you might have heard the Partnership for Chemical Risk Assessment, PARC. 
So it's something where the collaboration is already happening. This partnership is currently ongoing. It has more than 400 partners, uh, or, or, no, no, 200 partners, over 26 or 27 countries within Europe. And the goal is really to improve the current risk assessment methodology. So we have need for toxicologists, modelers, um, but people who also study exposure in different environmental fields and so on. So that's one part of the story. But uh, maybe the collaboration between scientists and and uh, from, from different countries and policymakers can also be done through official development aid. You know, this exists. I think the bilateral discussions between ministers of two countries saying we need some assistance or between the European, um, um, how is it called, embassy is not the right word, but the European representation in countries outside the EU, there are some sort of assistance that are made available through TIEX, for example, or so other vehicles where we can bring in scientists to help also uh, and also discuss with the scientists in different countries within different continents and spread the knowledge and strengthen the capacities in, on the <coughs> ground in, in the country. So these are definitely available avenues. Thank you. I think I have a, one last question, if that's okay, Joel. Of course. Mm. Uh, one, we haven't talked about the media. We haven't talked about you know, broader outreach, amplifying you know, all of the science. Um, does anybody have any good examples of how science and the media have worked together perhaps to raise awareness of issues, really get it onto the agenda of, of a minister, for example. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, uh, Pete Myers for years has sort of convened this group of some of us environmental health scientists to get us media training so that we know how to talk to reporters and journalists, how to get our message out into the world. And it's been, I think, incredibly effective. And... Um, it makes you less scared to do that. It also, you know, Joelle and I were talking about this yesterday, the need to actually train people to be careful about how they communicate, to not overly hype their work or to, to promise more than what the work actually says or does or offers. And so I do think training of scientists in that arena is um, really important. But I can also say that I hear from people from like past lives, not literally, not that creepy stuff, but like, you know, <laughs> someone I grew up with who says, I just saw your name in Cosmopolitan. I saw you on HBO. And it makes them believe it more because they read it from a place or they see it in a place that the media lends legitimacy as long as it's the right kind of media. So it's a way to extend our message. It often makes very complicated things accessible to people. And the chemical space is complicated. Mm -hmm. It's complicated ideas. And most of us are not trained in how to communicate that way. I can't fully, I can't communicate in cartoons, right? And yet that's what's often the way that people get the message. So I think you're right. We, we need to engage with the media, but we need to do it responsibly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I very, very good example uh, was like the case for Rwanda. And for three years, you know, the government basically and scientists basically constantly communicated with the public, you know, on the, you know, the hazards that, you know, single use plastics do in the country and so many other things. So that's like just um, as important too, to like communicate with the wider public because they can like frustrate, you know, and they can also like accept a policy. Um, and it's also very important that like we make it, you know, bite size, you know, in a very easy to digest manner for, you know, local people. Because um, communities really need to be empowered, uh, because usually when we talk about you know non-communicable diseases, you know, when we talk about like pollution and many other things, it usually really affects vulnerable people the most. You know, because when 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 you're like installing like a recycling factory and many other things, it's usually maybe go to a remote community or a, you know in quote an informal settlement, you know, where they probably do not appreciate their land or they don't like really appreciate these issues. And it's very important to like be able to communicate with the people you know on on the ground so that they can really go to their policymakers you know ask for you know ask more question about this and do not uh, and be able to like be able to reduce the effects of pollution you know generally 
Yes. Yes. Thank you. There is anyone else yeah. who would well, like to chip uh, in, please? I agree completely with what you have said. And also, as we need scientists for our negotiations, also media, they need scientists also to report what's happening in a negotiation. You know, and I'm sure what Desmond has said or what we heard from Pete or all the panelists here yesterday and today, I'm sure any journalist would like to write about that and also refer to that and refer to, to figures and refer to people with relation with the negotiation. So I think it's quite important actually. And actually it is also a way of pressuring us mm -hmm. for advancing in the negotiation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, John, please go ahead. I think, uh, it's important as well to, I think we also need to talk about that this is an integral part of a scientist's job. It's not something you should do on your free time. It's something that you should probably get funded for and should uh, be part of your uh, your day job as a scientist as well. And we, we try to support that in different ways. For example, we've supported a podcast. I think he might be here even <laughs> see us. But we've supported a podcast about this issue, for example, and uh, also given funds to researchers to be able to travel to science policy conferences. So I think that's maybe something to bring home to your own countries as well, to see, to you know, get the messaging out that this is an important part of the academic career. And it's both something that is meriting and that, uh, that should be funded. Yeah, I was going to actually say the, the speak to some of the YouTubers and podcast creators because the young ones are coming forward and some of them are really good in communicating chemical issues. Uh, at least in my country, I know about two examples, like former chemical teacher, uh, not that she was tired of her work, but actually during the pandemic, she found out that the way of bringing in um, um, the lessons to, the, to her students were actually reached out to a much wider community. So she left the formal teaching at one school, but now she is actually teaching much more because there are even parents participating and listening to, to her and learning more about uh, different complex chemical issues. The second topic that I wanted to bring in, it's actually not necessarily using media yet, but it's word of mouth. Um, and it's, it's a company that works, uh, that does uh, waste scan and tries to find different uses for different waste streams. So actually they are really teaching and th these are not just chemical companies or waste managers, but they are really trying, they are thinking of, okay, so let's reduce our waste. Let's reduce things that we dispose of if they have any value, if they can be, because your waste can be a value source for, for somebody else, and it's not about just recycling it, but finding use of it. And they have grown exponentially. Uh, they, have not, they have started, I think, four years ago. Now they are in 12 or 15 countries in Europe, and they are really spreading. So they, they, they work a lot. If someone is interested, I can, I can uh, you know, point you to their website and you can look. It's basically a hub for people who say, OK, I have this and then this amount of waste. It can be in kilograms, it can be in tons, no matter how hazardous it is. There is always a possibility of find a use or not. There is something that has a value in it. And the, the, the speed in which this company is working is remarkable. Fantastic. Thank you. Well, Joelle, shall we wrap this up? It, I'm getting yeah, the nervous about out. this. Uh, the time is red, uh, shouting at us. <laughs> the the sign here. <laughs> well, it, it, thank you so much for this panel. I mean, we have ranged over a whole... Uh, sort of, I don't know, a field of different tools that we can use when looking forward, when moving from reactivity to proactivity, from insight to action, whether that's using clinicians, whether that is trying to build new coalitions of the willing in the industry and corporate sector, finding and operationalizing the science policy interface. It's been really great to be inspired by your panel. Thank you very much. And I, we're going to ask you to leave the stage. Thank you. <laughs> if that's all right. And really now it's my turn to say thank you very much uh, for your engagement, uh, for being here and contributing to these rich discussions. Uh, before I invite our final 
speaker onto the stage to round everything off. I just wanted to uh, leave you with a few things that I particularly have picked up over the course of the, the last couple of days. The first is that the triple crisis is a reality and that our knowledge of the impacts on human, environmental and animal uh, health is sufficient to make ignorance or indifference inexcusable. Secondly, we know enough about what is causing impacts to take action now. We know the scale of the problem. We know who's responsible. And even the knowledge gaps are visible. Whether that's NAMs, testing for cocktail effects, data and such. But things are happening too slowly. Bashkut reminded us that it was 1972 when we first started talking about a healthy environment and how that was a critical part of human rights. And it was only 50 years later that the UN General Assembly then adopted a resolution on the right to a safe and healthy environment. So setting up governance does take time and it does require persistence, but we do need to get it out there that pollution and impacts are accumulating and that chemical developments are running ahead of our regulatory capacity. But we have four principles that we can really turn to and must hold fast to. One, precautionary principle. Two, the polluter pays principle. Three, reduce and remove as a principle. And fourthly, sufficiency. And lastly, I want to just round off by saying that I think that that last panel, but also linking back to our very first speaker, Leo, who talked about the importance of having a strategy. We do need a strategy, a strategy that addresses the question of when, that seeks to use windows of opportunity, and we know that next year in the European context, that's a critical window of opportunity. But we also need it to set a long-term agenda. We need to have a strategy that addresses who, that builds coalitions, and identify specific targets for our engagement. And lastly, have a strategy about what. Have focus, be realistic, and harness, if you like, the forces, financial, political, that are already in play, and make sure that we're identifying solutions that scale. Thank you very much. It's been a privilege to be your moderator over the last couple of days. I'd now like to invite our last speaker onto the stage, Professor Johan Schnurer, who is the Vice-Chancellor of Örebro University and is also on the steering committee of the Uppsala Health Summit and I believe is also one of the founders. Please, welcome. Thank you very much, Robert, and thank you for steering us and moderating us so expertly during this meeting. Yes, it's true. Eleven years ago, I had a small part in shaping what would become the highly successful Uppsala Health Summit meetings. And I'm very pleased to see that the basic structure holds even to this day. It's been fantastic to be here with you. I'm representing the, the partners, the, the three universities, the two government agencies and the city of Uppsala and the region of, of Uppsala who are the partners. And I'm also, I think, able to speak for the sponsors, the pharmaceutical industry and Formas, which you heard recently. And uh, in that declaring that th this has been a really good example of how science, uh, policy makers, industry can meet and interact. Uh, I've learned a few new words. I've realized that one health is really not one, it's much more. And this is a, a very good development and a good understanding. At my own university, we have three defined profile areas, specifically focusing on AI and robotics, food and health, pollutants and society, linking together uh, social sciences and natural science, medical science, technical sciences. So for us in particular, this has been extremely helpful. I can't but being 
of my age, age rich, which a few of us, few other here are, I, I can't help uh, remembering the film, the movie, The Graduate, Mandoms Provet in Swedish. Came out 1967, made the career of Dustin Hoffman and, and the music of Simon and Garfunkel worldwide known. But what I remember best is one line, <laughs> an advice to the graduate, by an elder man. There's a great future in plastics. And I'm not so sure after being at this conference that this was a very good advice. <laughs> I'm relieved to hear that we are dealing with plastic in a serious way, that there will be a plastic treaty and there might be on chemicals. I was a bit scared learning about the 16,000 different chemicals that might be found in plastic and maybe that our ways of thinking of recycling are not the proper ways at all. I'm uh, happy to, hear, to have heard so much about the need for solutions and also for the need for the reverse dialogue policy to science. We speak a lot about science to policy, but we as scientists need to learn much more from the policy makers. With that, I realize that I'm the one standing behind you and your flights or your travels within Sweden or your dinner later. So I will close this very successful summit. Thank my colleagues in the steering committee, the advisory board, the hardworking program committee, I heard from the chair that the really hardworking people have been those leading the workshops, but maybe she is a bit too modest. And of course, our wonderful secretariat that had made all this possible. So I ask you to join me in, in an applause for all the people that have contributed. Thank you for coming to my hometown. Thank you. And with this, you are free to disperse in an organized manner.